How do you do, everyone? We're greeting you now from the Naval Air Base at Lake Hurst, New Jersey, from which point we're going to bring you a description of the landing of the mammoth airship Hindenburg, which was due here in, in America this morning at dawn, completing the first transatlantic crossing of the 1937 season. Charlie Nielsen, one of our WLS engineers, is here at my side working the controls. We both flew down from Chicago yesterday afternoon aboard one of the giant new 21-passenger flagships of American Airlines. It took us only three hours, 55 minutes, to fly non-stop from Chicago to New York. When we landed at Newark, we found another flagship of American Airlines waiting to take us to Lakehurst with our equipment when we were ready to go. And incidentally, American Airlines is the only airline in the United States which makes connections with the Hindenburg. And as we came in for a landing on the runway of the field here at Lakehurst, we could easily see that a great event was about to take place. Last-minute preparations were being made to handle the landing of this great ship. It was just one year ago today, May 6th, that the Hindenburg made its first regular passenger flight to America, the flight that inaugurated the first air service across the Atlantic. So this occasion is doubly significant. It is the first anniversary of the inauguration of the service and marks the first flight of this year. The Hindenburg left Frankfurt, Germany, yes, uh, Tuesday evening, rather, at 7.30, their time. And for better than two and a half days, they've been speeding through the skies over miles and miles of water here to America. It was due to land at Lakehurst this morning at dawn, but we learned after our arrival at Newark that adverse wind conditions had been encountered over the area surrounding Newfoundland, which slowed the speed of the ship considerably. Now, when I say that it slowed the speed of the ship, by that I mean the speed of the travel over water or land. Now, the ship keeps in the air a constant speed which is in the neighborhood of 80 miles an hour. If it is flying into a wind of, say, 30 miles an hour, as it has been all last night, the 30 miles an hour must be subtracted from its airspeed to give us the speed it travels over land or water, which would be 50 miles an hour when we make the subtraction. Now, if we had received a tailwind, one that would help it along, then we'd have added the 30 miles to the airspeed, and it would have helped the Hindenburg to travel over land at a total of 110 miles an hour. In that case, the ship would have come in ahead of time this morning or long before dawn. The Hindenburg made its first appearance shortly after noon today over the New York metropolitan area. All during Wednesday night, Charlie Nielsen and I stayed in constant touch with all the radio communication systems which were in steady contact with the airship, getting last-minute bulletins and so forth. And are we glad the seats in the American Airline passenger office in Newark are air cushions? We warmed them plenty all through the night, believe you me. On the Hindenburg are 39 passengers and a crew of 61. The Hindenburg circled over New York and is pointed for the base here at Lakehurst, where we are now broadcasting this description. Now, you may wonder why the ship didn't land the moment that it arrived at Lakehurst. As a word of explanation, these giant ships cannot be landed, or perhaps, I, should I say, should not be landed at midday. The reason being, there are so many shifting surface winds that it would bounce and toss the ship around too much. It must either be landed early in the quiet of the dawn or during the quiet period just around sunset. And it's just about sunset and almost at the end of twilight right now. And raining, raining as hard as could be. Now, those are ideal times early in the morning or late in the evening when the weather conditions have proven to be most satisfactory. In other words, nothing's left a chance or made subject to unnecessary risk. Safety comes first, as it always should. Now, the ship has been over the field several times. It's a beautiful field here. It's a sort of a sandy and grass combination with tarvia or hard surface runways in all directions so they can take off and land into the wind uh, from any angle. Now, while we're, we're waiting for the ship to come back over the airport and to come into the uh, mooring mast, let me say a few words about the preparations which have been made here at Lakehurst. Doubtless, all of you know that the great part of this naval air base has played in the lighter than air transportation here in the United States. The facilities are adequate for the handling of the largest airship built. Just a little piece from where I'm standing is the great mooring mast. To this mast is attached the nose of the airship. It is so constructed that as the winds change, the top of the mast can be turned, allowing the airship to swing with its nose always into the wind. 
Inasmuch as the Hindenburg is 811 feet long, the mast of necessity must be quite a distance from the hangar, allowing clearance of the ship if it swings around the mast. The landing crew of the air base here is expertly trained to handle these massive ships of the sky. Each man is assigned a particular post, and when the word is shouted that the ship is coming in, this man knows just exactly what is expected of him. That's a fine crew of men, if you've ever seen one. Now, we've been told that the airship is going to make an attempted landing in the rain, and if that is the case, we're going to have a mighty fine description of you because uh, of it for you, because the men will have a difficulty in keeping footing in the sand, and especially since it's wet. Now, the structure is light, and yet so strong in the Hindenburg. From the ground as the ship passed us, we could see the passenger quarters. They're located just about a third of the distance back of the nose and just about a third of the distance from the keel. They're sort of square in shape and seem to extend the entire width of the ship. There are two decks, A and B, A being the main one and the one where most of the passengers assemble during the passage. Lining the sides of the deck are the observation windows. Now, they're slanted so that uh, it will give anyone in the interior a fine view downward. And no doubt as the ship went over a number of times, the people were looking down at the great mass of humanity assembled here in the field. A thousand people have come out to witness the landing of this great airship. Right, sir, sir. Now, there's a long, wide counter inside the observation section of the ship, and you can look down to the ground below, leaning on a table. And below the table, you see a relief map of the various air routes of the world. So as you travel along in the Hindenburg, you can watch the progress shown up on this map. Deck A is the upper of the two decks, and to get to deck B, it's necessary for you to walk through a foyer and down a pair of stairs. There you find what is really a combined smoking room and lounge. Passengers are always thrilled when Captain Max Priest or Captain Ernst Lehmann We'll take you a trip to the, the giant airship. So it's many sections, up and down along the aluminum alloy girders, over the catwalks, which lead from one area to another. And then you see a, a maze of bright metal girders everywhere. And after a walk through the ship, you're ready to rest, where you've covered a great amount of space, and you realize that you have traveled a great distance. Now they're coming in to make a landing of the Zeppelin. I'm going to step out here and uh, cover it from the outside, so... As I move out, we'll just stand by a second. Well, here it comes, ladies and gentlemen. We're out now, outside of the hangar, and what a great sight it is. A thrilling one. It's a marvelous sight. It's coming down out of the sky, pointed directly towards us and toward the mooring mass. The mighty diesel motors just roared, the propellers biting into the air and throwing it back into a gale-like whirlpool. No wonder this great floating palace can travel through the air at such a speed with these powerful motors behind it. Now, the sun is striking the windows of the observation deck on the eastward side and sparkling like gl glittering jewels on a background of black velvet. And every now and then the propellers are caught in the rays of the sun and their highly polished surfaces reflect circles of gold. Now, the field that we thought active when we first arrived has turned into a moving mass of cooperative action. The landing crews have rushed to the post, the post and spots and orders are being passed along, and last-minute preparations are being completed for the moment we have waited for so long. The ship is riding majestically toward us like some great feather, riding as though it was mightily, mighty proud of the place it's playing in the world's aviation. The sh ship is no doubt bustling with activities we can see. Orders are shouted to the crew. The passengers are probably lining the windows looking down at the field ahead of them, getting their glimpse of the mooring mast. And these giant flagships standing here, the American Airlines flagships, waiting to rise them to all points in the United States when they get the ship moored. There are a number of important persons on board, and no doubt the new commander, Captain Max Trish, is thrilled, too, for this is his great moment, the first time he's commanded the Hindenburg. For in previous flights, he acted as a chief officer under Captain Lehman. It's practically standing still now. They've dropped ropes out of the nose of the ship, and... Uh, has been taken a hold of down on the field by a number of men. It's starting to rain again. It, the rain had uh, slacked up a little bit. The back motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it from... It bursts into flames. 
It bursts into flame and it's falling. It's crashing. Watch it. Watch it. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. Get this Charlie. Get this Charlie. It's flying and it's crashing. It's crashing terrible. Oh my. Get out of the way, please. It's burning and bursting into flames and, and it's falling on the morning fast and all the folks between it. This is terrible. This is the one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's, it's, it's this place is 20, oh, four or 500 feet into the sky. And it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now, and the flame is crashing to the ground, not quite to the mooring mass of the humanity. And all the fans are just screaming around here. I don't do it. I can't even talk to people. The fans are out there. It's a, it's, it's a, oh, I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. On this, it's just laying there a mass of smoking wreckage. <laughs> and everybody can hardly breathe and talk and scream. Lady, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Honestly, I, I can hardly breathe. I, I'm going to step inside where I cannot see it. <laughs> Charlie, that's terrible. <laughs> I can't. I, listen, folks, I, I'm going to have to stop for a minute because I've lost the voice. This is the worst thing I've ever witnessed. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, I'm back again. I've, I've, I've sort of recovered from the terrific explosion and the terrific crash that occurred just as it was being pulled down to the mooring mast that's still smoking and flaming and crackling and banging down there. And I don't know how many of the ground crew were under it when it fell. There's a, not a possible chance for anyone to be saved. The relatives of the people who are waiting here ready to welcome their loved ones that came off this great ship are... are broken up they're carrying them in to give them first aid and to restore them some of them have fainted and the people are rush, rushing down to the uh, burning ship the uh, fire trucks have all uh, gone down to see if they can extinguish any of the blaze whatsoever but the terrible amount of uh, hydrogen gas in it just caused the, the tail surface broke into flame first then there was a terrific explosion and that's followed by the burning of the nose and the crashing nose into the ground and everybody tearing back at breakneck speed to get out from underneath it because it was over the people at the time it burst into flames. Now, whether it fell on the people who were witnessing it, we do not know. But as it exploded, they rushed back. And now it's smoking a terrific black smoke floating up into the sky. The flames are still leaping maybe 30, 40 feet from the ground the entire 811 feet length of it. They're frantically calling for uh, ambulances and things. The wires are being hu uh, humming with uh, activity. And uh, I've, I've lost my, my breath several times during this exciting moment here. Uh, will you pardon me just a moment? I'm not going to stop talking. I'm just going to swallow several times until I can keep on. I should imagine that the nose is not uh, more than 500 feet or maybe 700 feet from the mooring mass. They had dropped two ropes, and uh, whether or not uh, some spark or something set it on fire, we don't know, or whether something pulled loose on the inside of the ship causing a spark and causing it to explode in the tail surface. But everything crashed to the ground, and there's not a possible chance of anybody being saved. I wish I could stop in just a moment and uh, see if I can get my breath again. And Charlie, if you'll fade it out just a minute, I'll come back with more description, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm back again. I, I raced down to the burning ship, and just as I walked up to the ship, over climbed over the picket line, I met a man coming out, a dazed, dazed. He couldn't find his way. I grabbed a hold of him. It's Philip Mangone, Philip Mangone, A-N-G-O-N-E, of New York. Philip Mangone, he's burned terribly in the hands, and he's burned terribly in the face, his eyebrows, and all his hair is burned off, but he's walking and talking plainly and distinctly, and he told me he jumped. He jumped with other passengers. Now, there's a Mr. Spay. It sounds like Spay. We're not sure of it. And uh, he also got out, and we noticed the uh, lines, the different lines, the, uh, the uh, airship lines and the American Airways, their ambulances are down there, and they're taking people out of the wreckage. It seems that a number of them jumped clear when the explosion occurred in the tail. 
Now, I've, I've just been running up with Mr. Mangone and put him in a car. His wife and daughter met him, and I put them in the car with him and sent him to the field hospital with the other passengers who have been saved. Now, the mass of wreckage is still burning, and I want to repeat again something that I may not have, got clear, have gotten cleared in the hysteria of the moment. The explosion occurred in the tail surfaces, in the fins, the part that was highest, after it had nosed in to go down to the um, mooring mass. Now, whether something slipped in the back and caused the spark to set off the gas, we do not know. You see, they're using hydrogen in this, or they were using hydrogen in this plane, and it is extremely explosive. In fact, they wear ve velvet and felt shoes when working among the rafters around the, heel uh, the uh, hydrogen gas bag. Now, something may have slipped, causing a spark to set off some hydrogen which had leaked out into the structure. It's still burning. I don't know what is burning. Evidently, part of the cargo. Uh, it's still flaming, 10 or 15 feet high. They're still rushing people out of it. Now, it is my sincere hope that, that as many as, as possible, and as many as I think got out, I think a majority of the passengers jumped when it came close to the ground, according to what Mr. Mangone told me. He says, thank God he jumped, and, and we say thank God for him also. And uh, it's still smoking. The wreckage is smoking. They've uh, wired all the available services, fire apparatus and everything to come rushing in, and doctors and nurses to come down to take care of the people that are being taken out of the burning wreckage. Now, it lays 811 feet of just smoldering rooms, ruins now. Uh, I couldn't talk when I saw it. I hope, I hope that, that it isn't as bad as I made a sound there at the very beginning. Now, while I get my breath, I'm going to check and see if there are any more saved out of it. All right, Tal. Will you please save it out now? I'll come in just a bit later. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, we're back with another important bulletin. Um, Mr. O'Laughlin from the Consumers Company of Chicago was one of the passengers aboard the uh, airship when it burst into flames, and he managed to get free of the wreckage, and he's standing here right by my side. I can't ask him to go on the air, but he wants me to tell the folks that he is all right. Mr. O'Laughlin of the Consumers Company of Chicago, and here is another man coming in. He's burned considerably, Mr. Otto Clemens. Mr. Otto Clemens is safe, although he's burned quite badly. Now, I'm... The Clemens isn't burned at all? Thank you, thank you. He's, he's sitting right here. That's composed. And is that his mother with him? No, that's a friend. A friend of his? Yeah. Well, Mr. Clemens, how did you manage to get out? Alive? Yes, sir? Yes. We, have, we have to ask the Clemens. Yes. He's only speaking now. Uh, what is that radio? Yeah. Now, I'm sitting on the passenger camera. Also oben vom Speiseraum zu meinem Koffer gegangen und im Moment kommt nun äh, eine Flamme und das Schiff fängt an zu schwanken, sinkt nach unten und ich springe dann an der Luke heraus, die unten neben der, äh, neben der Bar ist, unten am, am unteren Gang, wo jetzt die neuen Kabinen eingebaut sind. Ne? He was on his way to his cabin when the, when the flame... You tell the folks. We, he was we, on his way to the cabin, the cabin yes. when the flash came yes, and he jumped out. He jumped out of the cabin. Jumped out. Yeah. And, how, and uh, did he, he didn't get hurt a bit in the same No, he isn't hurt a bit. And I not hurt at all. Oh, I'm so thankful for you. I'm so thankful for you. And uh, you tell him in, in your language that we're thankful that he got out alive. Uh, and uh, now, Charlie, if you'll fade it out just a minute, so I see if I can get some more information. And now, friends, I want to tell you, I'm back here. I want to tell you that the wreckage is still flaming out there, but I have some very good news for you. Uh, I just came from the front of the building where they have set up an emergency station, and they claim that between 25 and 30, that is the estimate, between 25 and 30 are saved out of the wreckage. Now, I have here a total of 39 passengers and 61 crew. That would make an even 100, but they tell me there were about 106 on board, so that makes 35 out of, uh, between 25 and 30, out of 106 so far uh, saved and, uh, and uh, accounted for that have, uh, they have been identified. 
Uh, it's still smoking. They can't get to the back part of the wreckage yet. It would be impossible because the uh, flames are, let's see, about uh, 10 or 15 feet still leaping in the air. The front part of the ship is intact for about 30 feet back. The nose of it is intact. Uh, it evidently had exploded and uh, burned before it, that part of the ship struck the ground, or even though it was the uh, first part of the ship that should have struck the ground. It didn't. The burning mass held the back of the wreckage into the air, and that, I think, is what saved the passengers for the simple reason that it gave them a time to jump. If the explosion had occurred in the front of the airship, they wouldn't have had time to jump because it would have blown the cabin right out of the bottom of the dirigible. But, inasmuch as the flaming mass held the wreckage in the air, that made it possible for them to jump, and we are so thankful because from where we could see, we saw the first every one of them, and the ground crew were gone. But I guess the ground crew had a chance to get out, and it was back, just a little bit back of the picket line, so that none of the spectators uh, got underneath the wreckage. We're so thankful for that, and in checking, not a single spectator, only the persons engaged in the lowering of the giant ship and the people who were on board. Now, we have not uh, received any information as to whether the crew escaped, any of the crew escaped, because they were evidently up in the working part of the ship and wouldn't be down in the passenger compartment. Now, how they managed to jump, I have not been able to determine yet, unless they broke through the windows or there may be a possibility that the windows are open. They're open at the top so that they could climb out over and drop down, the man tells me right here. They jumped through the window, or they didn't stop to open the window. Mr. Clemens here jumped right through the glass window, and it's fine that it was of a breakable nature that they could get out, and therefore save their lives. Now, we can hear the sirens as they're tearing down here beyond us to fight to balance of the fire. Uh, the people are crowded down around there. I haven't a very good vision of it. Yes, I do now, right through an open window here, and the people are divided, and I can still see the mass of wreckage burning. I'm standing in the airplane hangar, the airplane division of the Lakehurst Field. It has stopped raining altogether, and uh, it's not hampering, or rather hindering, the uh, rescue work. If it was muddy and slippery, it would hinder the uh, taking out of, of survivors. Now, I'm going to stop for a breath of air and uh, see if I can check up and find out if there are any more or any members of the crew have been saved. All right, Charlie, just a minute. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'll just walk back in here and see the office after checking up with a, a member of the crew. It happened to be... was maybe one of the stewards. He looked like he was one of the stewards. And uh, another man here. And uh, what was, did you know the other man's name? Did you? Uh, did you know the, oh no, uh, yes, I announced it, Mr. Clement. All right, and there's another man just walked up. And Mr. Hanneberg, too, I want to tell you, is uninjured, and he walked in here with several bundles under his arm. Now, what, what uh, that man had in his arms when he fell out of the Dirigible, I don't know, but he has two uh, paper bundles, and there's not a bit of scorching on either bundle. Now, how it happened, I couldn't begin to tell you, because uh, he landed in, the, it's fortunate that it was over where there's deep sand, and when they jumped down out of the dirigible, out of the cabin, they lit into the sand, and they didn't receive any broken bones, the ones that we, I have talked to. They're all standing in here, uh, getting first aid treatment, and uh, they're awfully shocked, naturally, they would be. But there's no arms, legs broken, they're, they're walking around here talking about it, and uh, some of them uh, are talking in German, and I have to have an interpreter to find out exactly uh, who they are and uh, what capacity they were on the uh, ship. Now I'm going to stand by for another uh, boulevard, or uh, bulletin, I'm so excited that uh, they've just received now uh, that there, there are four or five airplanes coming over. I'm going to take a look and see. Just a second. Uh, maybe we can hear. 
They're coming. No. They're, yes, they're coming in. There's several ships coming in. They've wireless for them. And uh, perhaps you can hear down at the end of the field, I don't know, the sirens are screaming. The mess, the wreckage is still burning. It's been burning now, I should say, approximately 25 minutes or more. It has been burning constantly. What it is that's burning, I don't know, unless it is the gasoline and oil supply, because the smoke is is uh, terrific. It's billowing into the sky for a third of a mile high. It is the oil supply. It is the oil supply because the gasoline supply would have been consumed by this time. And that makes it doubly hard for them to fight to fight the uh, fire on account of it being oil. But there's a lot of sand here, and if they can get close enough to throw sand on it, that might stop some of the blazing. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to stop just a moment. They're uh, needing some help, and I'm going to see if I can't go out and do my part. Just a moment. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been 15 minutes since I talked to you last, although we're continuously uh, transcribing this for you, and uh, the fire is still burning out on the field. It is dark now, almost dark, and the uh, masses of flame are still leaping from the wreckage. Now, an American Airlines flagship just took off with 21 passengers on board and the stewardess and, and crew of two. Now, the stewardess is a registered nurse. She has a first aid kit on board the plane, and they have injured in it, rushing them to New York for aid. Now, how many are on board? I don't know. But we have received that 15 out of 16 so far are living. 15 out of 16. And um, also, I want, to, I want to mention something else here, too, that uh, some of the crew, some of the crew have uh, been able to get out. Now, there's an officer, a German officer here, speak, uh, speaking to uh, men of his own race, and I cannot understand him, and I'm not going to interrupt him to bother him, but um, the United States Navy. Now, let me make a mention here of the United States Navy and what they are doing in this crisis. I never have seen such a smoothly working, systematized action in my life. The men have raced out there with their firefighting apparatus, had the survivors in the cars, and raced to the hospital before I had time to run down after talking to you to get into the wreckage. Uh, commander Charles Rosendahl, the great commander of the United States Navy, is out there directing all activities. He's doing a man-sized job for the man that he is, and our credit goes to him. We take off our hat to him. And those sailors and the Marines and the regular Army men and the pilots of both Army and Navy who have flown in here are out there doing their darndest to get the people out of the wreckage. They're still taking people out. Some of them are badly injured. A number of them are dead. Now, we told you there are approximately 106 on board, and uh, so far we have only known of about 25 safely getting away from the wreckage, and we are sure of about 16. Now, if, if uh, we are going to uh, broadcast any longer here, I'm going to have to step over to the window where the mass of uh, wreckage is still burning out there to get a better view. I see people walking back and forth in front of an automobile circling it, and um, inasmuch as that's an oil fire, as I told you before, uh, they can't do much with it. They can't get near it. It's so hot. And um, I'm going to stand by for another few minutes until I get uh, accurate data to give you. So just stand by. I'll be back with you. I'm back again, ladies and gentlemen, with more information about this terrible disaster down Lake Hurst, New Jersey, in which the Hindenburg crashed while being moored at the mooring mast. Uh, three children have been saved. Uh, three children were brought over just just for the, the excitement of the trip, and we're going to be taking back three children by the name of Daner, the O-E-H-N-E-R, three children by the name of Daner. There was also a radio officer. One of the radio officers of the Hindenburg jumped, jumped through the glass. Uh, they, had, uh, non, uh, they had breakable, rather, breakable glass in all the windows, 
naturally they would have at that altitude and flying up where they wouldn't, it wouldn't hit anything. And he managed to jump, to kick his way out through the uh, deck onto the sand. Now, I figure that there was about um, 60 feet, a uh, 60-foot drop from the ship. The tail went up in the air, and as I told you on previous occasions, that uh, it held up there long enough for them to jump from the cabin. Now, his name, this radio officer's name, is Schweikhard. S-C-H-W-E-I-K-A-R-D. And all I could understand him to say was that he jumped and evidently was thrown, too, at the same time because the ship was uh, vibrating. There were three distinct explosions. If I remember correctly, I'll have to check back in the earlier part of this broadcast and see if that was not right. The tail surface, then the center section, and then the nose of it destroyed. It's still burning, and uh, I imagine it's now uh, 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. Did you get that? 7.30, and uh, the plane is still burning, or rather, the dirigible is still burning, and I think that, if I'm not mistaken, it has been burning an hour. Am I right in that, Charlie? Just about one hour. Because it had stopped raining, and they were coming in for this landing and mooring. We have not yet been able to find out what caused the explosion, but it's very evident that there was a spark 50 nitrogen on fire. There wasn't any electricity. There was no electrical storm. It was raining uh, previously to that, but no electricity could have set it on fire unless it was static electricity because we had had a thunderstorm, a very light thunderstorm, but there was a lot of electricity in the air, so maybe a spark jumped from one of the beams in the tail surfaces across. That would be a logical interpretation of it inasmuch as they were coming in close uh, proximity to the ground the static electricity may have increased and caused an explosion like that. Now, we're trying to get more information, and uh, between these broadcasts, we're doing all we can to help uh, the people who are injured. We have most of the living ones in here back in the German office in the back part. That is the Hindenburg office, back part of the hangar. Uh, they're here. I can't understand half of them. We have an interpreter, and we're getting as much information as we can. Now... Mr. Um, let me see, Mr. Uh, Byrne from the Chicago office, and Mr. Reinstrom from the Chicago offices of the American Airlines, that's right, Charlie, American Airlines office, have just came out of the uh, radio room, which is to my back here, and told us that they have sent for all of the available stewardesses who are on call at Newark to rush by the plane that took the injured people to Newark and bring them back to Lakehurst. Now, uh, just as uh, they, they are so accurate here, the American Airlines, that I'll tell you what they have done. They have established a directional beam that will guide the ships in here at any hour. Now, now these ships can leave Newark and find the field, although from the sky they could see the burning wreckage and it would be easily to find, but they can come in here and land, be guided in here and land with their landing lights. So we're expecting a plane load of stewardesses. They're all registered nurses and they'll be in here very shortly. Now, Commander Rosendahl is over in the main part, over in the lighter-than-air hangar, which is just slightly longer than the Hindenburg. And they have established an emergency hospital base there. They pull tables together, and it houses the uh, Los Angeles and three blimps in there. Now, whether they're taking any of them out to make available room for hospitalization, I do not know, but I will find out and come back later. All right, Charlie, if you'll fade it out, I'll be back in a second. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm back again with another flash. I want to tell you that Nelson Morris of Chicago, Nelson Morris, a uh, very well-known Chicagoan on board is saved. He's safe. We were talking to him, one of the men here, and he is okay. Now, in giving you these names, these German names, such as Daner and Schweikard and so forth, those are the names the German people have given to me. And uh, being uh, unable to understand the individual person, uh, I'm giving the name as it sounded to me. Now, that, uh, that is just exactly what is happening. The wreckage is still burning. And uh, I'm, we're waiting for a plane of, to come in uh, with supplies and so forth and uh, emergency first aid apparatus. And as, as the uh, events occur, I'm going to come in on this 
and tell you about it. So just stand by a few minutes, and I'll have more information for you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back again now. It's uh, 8.15. We're terribly upset about this all. Uh, the fire is still burning just a little bit now. It's an oil fire, and it's a bad one to fight. We have one of the stewardess uh, from the ship of the American Airlines, one of the flagships which came in this afternoon to meet the Hindenburg when it landed. Uh, what is your name? Miss Tyler. Miss Tyler. Miss Tyler, would you uh, tell me where you've been over? You've been over in the lighter-than-air uh, building, haven't you? I've been and over in the hospital. Be, will you go ahead and tell them about it, being over in the hospital? I've been over in the hospital and seen this terrible calamity over there. And uh, have you you've been work, you're a registered nurse, and have you been working and helping get them out? Yes, uh, uh, how many do you, ha do you have over there, do you know? Oh, I, w I don't have any idea how many, but it's just an awful lot over there. Do you think there's 25 or 30? Oh, there's more than that. Oh, are they? All right, I won't make you talk anymore. Well, thank you very much, because uh, this is for future records, and, and anyone that we can get that will give us information on it will certainly appreciate it, and I want to thank you very much. Our friends... We've just received word that the American Airlines planes are going to be in here in just a very few minutes with uh, all the available registered nurses of their stewardesses at Newark. We're very short of doctors, however, according to the report. Uh, the medical doctors of the staff here at Lakehurst, the Navy men, and um, the other stations here are working frantically, doing their best with these nurses who are trained, of course, to the nth degree. They're all registered nurses. They're doing their part in um, alleviating suffering. Now, uh, the, as this young lady told you, we don't know how many are over in the lighter-than-aircraft which houses the Los Angeles. Uh, ships are coming in and out constantly here at the field. They have uh, fixed up an emergency lighting system. Uh, of course, they have the floodlights, but there's an emergency uh, oil uh, fire pot uh, system worked out, and in the... In the um, American Airlines, of course, has a direction beam into Lakehurst so that the American airliners are landing here with uh, their crews and the nurses and doctors and medical supplies. Now, we have just uh, received information that uh, Mr. Lehman, rather Captain Lehman, and uh, Captain Pruss, both of them uh, commanding officers of the uh, lighter-than-aircraft of the Hindenburg and the sister ships that they were going to construct over there, and we have uh, received information that they were saved, and there's another member of the crew, I couldn't get his name, but they were saved and they're in the hospital. Now, there's one of the men just walked in here uh, for first aid, which we gave him. Uh, his hands, his arms burned the back of his neck, and the explosion had blown the tops of his shoes off back to the heels. They were just sticking on by laces, and um, a little bit of the felt covering of the soles of the shoes still of it, uh, still on his feet. Um, his socks weren't, uh, weren't burnt off or anything, just the front toes of his shoes. The heels and the soles are intact. Now that is very strange, showing the terrific force of the explosion as he jumped through the window. And if the sand hadn't been heavy, outside, underneath where the uh, dirigible was coming in the land, to be moored to the mast there, none of them would have been saved. Now, of course, the, uh, they have 42 ma Navy men frantically searching among the debris down there, which is smoldering now, and every once in a while shooting up a bright flame and sparks, uh, searching to see if they can get any uh, further su survivors. Now, these three boys that I told you about have left. Now, there was a slight explosion in the back end of the ship now, and I see flames flying up again. Evidently, some of the oil supply. And... Um, we're going to try and get uh, some pictures, but I've covered everything with the pictures uh, for for records, for official records. Uh, we're still in the American, uh, or rather the United States Navy aeronautical hangar, the, the heavier-than-aircraft hangar. There are three planes here. We have the customs officer and uh, all his crew working on the men, the wounded people, and they've stretched out the tables out there and made sort of a... Uh, an emergency uh, cot system for them. The United States government post office is uh, turned over their force to uh, cooperate with the nurses in, in, in uh, taking the uh, 
entered to these tables. Uh, all of the government services have been trained uh, to the nth degree. I find that they're steady under the uh, greatest stress. They're calm, reserved, going about their business in an orderly fashion and doing more, perhaps, they and the American Airline nurses than any other unit I've ever seen, regardless of any place in an emergency act. And they certainly are doing a remarkable job. And I'm going to come back in just a few minutes with another bulletin. It's now 20 and a half minutes past 8 o'clock yeah, Central like Standard it. Time. And it's almost two hours. Now get this. It's almost two hours since the explosion. The, the explosion occurred at seven, uh, 632 Central uh, Eastern Standard Time. 632 Eastern Standard Time. And it is now 8.20 and a half. Almost two hours. And there's still spasmodic explosions from the oil in the back part of the dirigible. I'll be back just as soon as I have more information for you. Okay, Charlie. Back to the price, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the young stewardess uh, to whom uh, I talked a few minutes ago and who said she would rather not talk has composed herself now. She just came from a, a trying ordeal over in the lighter than aircraft hangar. And uh, she tells me that there are between 40 and 60 alive over there between 40 and 60 in the neighborhood of that many. Now, uh, she said that some of them have been, uh, have died since they were brought in and uh, that others are expected to die, but not, not so many, that uh, some of them have never even been scratched, uh, just their hair thins and eyebrows thins. Now, if, um, if there's any more confirmation on the fact of the 40 to 60 alive, uh, I will come in again and give it to you. Uh, we were trying to send someone over there, but the uh, lines are so strict that if we want to leave the air hangar here, the, uh, we will be unable to get back in. So we have to stick to our post here and take the people as they come in to report to the German office and uh, be checked in as alive or report someone who has died. Um, of course, the American Airway Express and all of the people are sending cars out uh, they're cooperating with the American Airlines in doing this, and everybody's doing his utmost to bring about uh, the easiest uh, end to this terrific tragedy that we've had. Now, I'll be back to the price later. <laughs>